Hey guys, we're talking about the trademark application preparation process. Ooh, say that twice. If you're ready to pursue a trademark, you will want to prepare some documents. Even if you are going to use a lawyer, you'll want to kind of come prepared. And I'm going to walk you through the three things that you need to kind of be thinking about before you prepare that application or retain your lawyer. Now, some of you will attempt to file your trademark on your own. I do not recommend this because trademark lawyers know how to properly classify, submit, describe, research, and make arguments on the application to get your trademark A, approved, and B, limit the office actions. If you guys are not sure what office actions are, let me explain to you how the trademark process works. So obviously you guys can go online and you can look up stuff. Most people that come to me, they say, oh, I already looked it up and I know that my trademark doesn't exist because I typed in my exact words and nothing came up. That's not thorough research on a trademark, and <laughs> that is not what a lawyer is going to do. They're going to go really deep into the research process to figure out whether or not your risk is high or low on your mark, and just kind of figure out all of the dangers that are out there with your trademark. And the thing that you really want to pay attention to is this thing called office actions, okay? So when you're filing a trademark, you are starting a legal process, okay? This is not just a paperwork or application that you submit to this office where there's just a whole bunch of administrative people kind of checking off of a, of a database. What happens with the trademark is that once that application is submitted, it goes to a set of lawyers. Lawyers who are working to make sure that everything inside of the trademark registration or registry is going to be protected. So their job is to make sure that their proverbial clients, the people who already have registrations, are not going to be offended or conflicted by what it is that you submitted. So an office action is when that attorney that's assigned to your trademark goes through the database, they look up things and they're like, oh, hold on. We found all these reasons why we don't think your trademark should be able to pass through. And so they will send you back a list of things that you have to do in order for them to say, yeah, no, we're not gonna do it. It's going to conflict with these other registrations. Or they'll say, if you can make this argument and you can make it based on the case law that we need and you can make it based on the you know the laws that are already established that keep you from getting this in we'll give it to you and so that is what the beauty of having a lawyer file your trademark is is because we already know what these people on the other side these other lawyers at the uspto are looking for we're looking we know what they're watching for when it comes to a trademark and so we know how to argue if they come back and they're like uh -uh. We know how to respond and say, okay, let's try it this way. And we will make a legal argument for why this thing should or shouldn't be. So if you guys are willing to go toe to toe with a lawyer, um, that's up to you. I wouldn't recommend it, but that is essentially in very common layman terms, exactly what happens when you submit your trademark application. Let's get back to this video. And now I'm going to break down three really simple mistakes that a lot of people make often in their trademark process that makes their application almost denied instantly. So we're going to start with trademark mistake number one. If your terms are too generic, you cannot own or monopolize the English language. And so what the trademark office is going to look for is something called distinctiveness inside of your mark. Like in a hypothetical situation, maybe you own a Mexican food restaurant and you have these delicious fajitas and you want to get them trademarked. And so you're gonna say, this menu item, we are calling Sam's Beef Fajitas, send it off to the trademark office, let's get it trademarked. What typically is gonna happen is the trademark office is gonna look for any generic terms. Terms that we use to just, in general, describe things. And in this case, beef fajitas, everybody knows what beef fajitas are. It's not something that you can own or trademark. And so the only thing that's distinctive is Sam's. Sam's beef fajitas, the only thing distinctive is Sam's. So what I want you guys to think about is how your mark plays into the bigger picture of the English language as well. And if your terms are too generic, you need to add some distinction in it so that it makes your mark stronger. Now, there's other things that, are, that you kind of have to think about when you're thinking about like common terms like beef fajitas is how they're being used. Because in that particular hypothetical that I just walked you through, we were talking about a Mexican food restaurant. So of course, beef fajitas, describing beef fajitas, that's common. Now let's think about something that's not so common that's very popular, apple. Now we're not talking about Alice's Country Red Apples to describe a red apple. 
We're talking about Apple computers. Now, a very common term, Apple, is not used commonly, and the application makes it distinctive and makes it a word that you can now trademark because you're not using it to describe the exact thing that the English language describes. Make sense? If you guys are finding this information valuable, please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell so you'll be notified when I post more videos just like this one. Now back to the trademark application prep. Mistake number two that people often make is they want to kind of claim city, states, regions. Here's the thing. The trademark office is really, really strict on deceptiveness. So there was a mark that was once filed and it stated in its term or in its label name that it was something, something, something Paris, okay? The trademark office denied it because it gave off the impression that the accessories that this clothing and apparel company were making came from Paris. You can't do that. So when you guys start thinking about Texas's best toast and you're a company that's in New York, you see, there's some conflict there. So even if it's your grandma's beautiful recipe straight from Mississippi and your company is based in LA, you wanna think about that. The third mistake that's often made is dealing with region. A lot of people don't understand regional trademark or the expansion of locale of a trademark. Now, most of the states in the US allow you to pass a trademark that is just statewide. It's easier to do it this way at times because if you know that you don't really expand or you don't see your brain expanding out of your state, for example, if you are a dentist and you are licensed in Delaware and you're just like, hey, I just want a Delaware trademark for my dentist office, chances of me having a, a trademark or needing my trademark in Wisconsin is slim, then you can always think about region and you can always think about where your trademark needs to be filed. Now, if you know that you are a brand that intends to franchise, you intend to do campaigns and marketing efforts that are just so expansive that they cover all the U.S. states, then you might need to do the regular trademark as people know it, as the USPTO, and do the federal trademark so that no matter what state you're in, you're protected with that trademark. So think about these things as you are going forward, but also think about the next version of region because this goes, I mean, people forget about this completely and they get these brands that are expansive and they lose the power to implement and enforce their trademark internationally. There's also that. Outside of having your registration protected in the US, you can also have your registration protected overseas in the EU, for example. So if you guys know that you are going to be mega stars, mega musicians, mega painters like painters, mega artists like Banks, then you can always trademark your stuff internationally. So there's a lot to think about and a lot of people ask me this question so I'm just going to answer it. When you are looking at the symbols, you have SM for a service mark or TM for a trademark. You can start to use those when you are having your application processed or the application is pending and then you'll always want to switch to that registration R with a circle around it once you finally get your registration completed to, be, to put the public on notice or make the public aware that you are actually officially registered as a trademark user and they shouldn't be infringing on your mark. All right, guys, so I hope this was super, super helpful. Don't forget, if you guys have not watched my Trademark vs. Copyright 101 video, to go back and watch that. It's super informative. I break down what a trademark is in a lot of detail. And I also explain a few things that can and cannot be trademarked. If you are in a process of really trying to figure this all out and you're like, I wonder if this can actually be trademarked. Guess what? I got you covered. I have a free downloadable that you can get. It's absolutely 100% free. Um, and it will kind of break down the 101 on trademark so that you guys can start to really fill it out and not be so confused. And of course, you can always call my office if you ever need a consultation with a lawyer or you ever need someone to help you with your trademark. And I'll put all the information down in the details below. And I want you guys to talk to me in the comments. Let's start to chat about all these legal things that might be confusing. And you guys can also suggest videos that you want me to put out because I love to help you guys. All right, so I'll see you in the next video. So many videos about trademark and copyright coming up. Can't wait to see you guys and see what you say. Think about them. See you later.